All right. Hey, friends, welcome. Welcome to the Calvinist Boo Crew. I'm your host, JC Bear. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you talking about the good things of God. What a blessing to be here with brothers and sisters. Let me just take a moment uh, to introduce our panel members. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about wisdom and, and wisdom literature. We spent some time uh, in a recent episode talking about Proverbs, but Proverbs is not the only book of wisdom literature in the scriptures. And so in particular, Ecclesiastes is a really special book, and, and I, need, I need the big guns talking with me on this one. So let's have a great time in the Lord together. Brother Kendo is here. Brother Ken, Ecclesiastes and Wisdom. It's one of the most impenetrable books in the Bible, according to some people. What do you think about this book, brother? And and what is it? What do you think about our the chance for us to have a talk about it today? Well, I think it's it's a good topic to talk about the wisdom of Solomon. You know, Solomon, he prayed when he was going to become king, and he asked the Lord, you know, Lord's like, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And he prayed for wisdom to, to, to rule the nation of Israel, to rule God's people with wisdom. And he asked for that, and God gave him that. It said, uh, the legend is that King Solomon was the wisest man, of course, next to the Lord Jesus, and of course, uh, he's God in the flesh. But, but you know, besides Jesus, wisdom, uh, Solomon was is thought of to be the wisest man who ever lived. So his thoughts and Proverbs and, Ecclesiastes and some of these these writings of his are uh, extremely insightful as far as life, just general life in the world goes, you know, and what we experience in life, the ups, the downs, uh, dare I say, the futility of life and what people go through in this world, the the vicissitudes of life and the the striving and the and the reaching and the and the you know, grabbing for more and what does it all mean in light of the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we have a God above us in light of eternity, you know? And so I, I think that Solomon used his incredible wisdom to try to give us insight into these things, into these, uh, into the, the situation in this world on God's green earth that, that we live in and that we're, where we are. So we can understand more about our life in this world as it pertains and is related to God and eternity and what is the purpose of life. Obviously there is a purpose for life. And so, uh, you know, God didn't waste all this space and time and energy for nothing. So we know that God has purposes for us. Uh, it says that all through the Bible. So, and I think that's what King Solomon tried to uncover with his advantages and wealth and opportunity as the King of Israel. Uh, he was given every advantage that a man can have, um, and he pursued it, and he gained some things, some useful insights, I think, that will help us as Christians. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, J.C. Bear. Amen, my friend. Amen. Well <clears throat> said. Now, Benjamin, wisdom wisdom comes in all sorts of shapes and, and sizes and domains, so someone can be wise in one area and yet be completely foolish in another. I, I remember watching a commercial um, where you know a nuclear physicist is giving a lecture in front of a crowd and he receives a standing ovation for his lecture and he walks out into the parking lot and goes to the car dealership and he walks in and starts talking to the car salesman and is completely out of his domain. So wisdom is funny that way, isn't it, brother? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think you're really right on there. I think that that's a really accurate assessment because in the dictionary, wisdom is defined as the ability to make right judgments. And sometimes we have the knowledge and understanding to be wise enough in an area to make right judgment and then in another area we just don't we're just ignorant and i think um i think that these books like ecclesiastes and proverbs 
I think the main thing that they are concerned with is moral wisdom and wisdom involving eternal matters. So, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I've said this many times to people, I've never said it on the show, but really, uh, you know, the Bible is more than just a book. It's a collection of writings that those writings have historical value, theological value, uh, they have philosophical value, um, and these books specifically capture that philosophical essence of the Bible probably more than anything, and uh, that's why they're so valuable and they stand out so much is that you really can learn a lot about how to live your life and do what you do, uh, you know, and, the, you know, people say, well, you know, that's not really philosophy, that's, uh, that's something else and it's like well no it really is just because it doesn't have a bunch of talk about substance and forms and nature and you know essences and all that stuff like that like found in classical greek philosophy doesn't mean it's not philosophy it is it's divine philosophy involving moral matters it's like it's like the highest form of ethical philosophy and teleology because it's addressing purpose uh it's, it's addressing ethics morals um you know, it's just, it's a big deal. Amen, brother. Amen. Now, Joshua, there's an interesting idea here that sometimes gets thrown around. And I remember when I was young, not that I'm old now, but I remember when I was young, there were a lot of people who, who would tell me, to my frustration, they would say, wisdom is for the for the old. And I've come to understand that there's a sense in which that's right and proper and correct. But 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 God gives gifts where he gives gifts, brother, doesn't he? And and, and what do you think about this idea that that knowledge and wisdom both are things for God to hand out as he wills, as he sees fit? Um, well, I think that's a pretty good insight, honestly. Um, it it is definitely uh, it's definitely a gift from God. I'll say this, and it's it's tough because you know people often conflate wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge, and all these things as as synonymous mistakenly, but they 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 really aren't. Um, <clears throat> wisdom, I, I think it was uh, Benjamin who it uh, provided the definition that wisdom is the basically the ability to make right decisions. Um, knowledge is just the possession of information about something. Um, and it's it's definitely a good point to bring up to say that the older or the older you get, the more wise you get. and that that stems from experience. I think, that when you compare Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, just to kind of go out of there, I think Proverbs was also authored by Solomon, I believe, at least parts of it. Um, and I, I like to look at it as when Solomon was a young man, he asked God for wisdom, and of course God gave it to him. And in that in that way, however God gave it to him, he, he had it, but the important part about Ecclesiastes is that after Solomon had lived his life knowing how to make good decisions and how to make intelligent um, moves, let's say, in in uh, his role as king, he then came to understand a lot more about it because of the experiences that he had. And those experiences will teach you even when you don't necessarily think that they can. It's it's It's... It's something that's like a, a word to the wise, if, to, if you'll pardon the, the little pun there. But I think that as a young person, a young person can be very wise. Um, but if if they don't if they don't respect experience in the long term, then they're going to set themselves up for failure. And I think that's why it's very beautiful that we have both books. And Ecclesiastes is basically saying, "Hey, at the end of all these things." After, after all the success I've had, these are the things that really matter. And so I think that's probably a, a good way to approach that. Amen. Amen. 
I love that opening. We are in a privileged situation to have this text. It is God's gift to us. And, and woe to the fool who doesn't realize this. And so with that in mind, we are normally you start at the beginning, and we are going to start at the beginning, but before we get to the beginning, Brother Ken, I just wondered if I could get you to read these verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 12 down through 15. 12 through 15. There you go. Okay, sure. The teacher speaks the futility of wisdom, verse 12. The teacher was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. Benjamin opening up with this theme, this investigative theme, the wisest man who's ever lived looks at reality through his perspective and offers us this conclusion. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. There's an existentialism here in that assessment. How does it strike you, and what are, what are some of the things that you think about when you reflect upon what he's trying to say? You know, me, what I see is I see the that he's he's observing a pointlessness a pointlessness to um, the world and the way the world works and you know I think that before Christ came especially that this really was the case was that uh, the things that were messed up in the world really couldn't be fixed and uh, I think that you know above all above all else this what is wrong can't be made right was you know sin in the world. And what is missing cannot be recovered, you know, that original state of perfection. And uh, I think that uh, without Christ coming to restore us, then, you know, it's, it's just, it's very difficult to find meaning and purpose in life. Brother Ken, what do you think of how the teacher opens in verse 12? I think it's awesome. I mean, King Solomon, he had every advantage over over all the other kings before him. So he realizes that God has blessed him. I think he does realize that, obviously. And he's set out to, on a journey now, to uncover the meaning of life, so to speak, I guess, from his very lofty vantage point, having access to every opportunity, all the riches, Everything that man and woman could want on the face of the earth, King Solomon pretty much tasted it all. So he wants to see, is there any wisdom that can be gleaned under God's green earth? You know, living in this fallen, sinful universe that we live in, it, that has created this futility that it talks about in Romans 8. Even the creation itself is subjected to futility and vanity, awaiting redemption. So kind of like what <clears throat> Benjamin and, Jason and Joshua were saying that, that uh, that Solomon wants to find out, you know, he wants to find out what can be gained. And see, I agree with, I think it was Joshua just said that, that uh, without God in your life, Solomon's diagnosis of reality in this world, in this universe, is pretty bleak. It's pretty pretty meaningless, pretty pointless. It's striving for win. You can't have the stuff in life. You can't hold it in your hand. You know, it's, it's fleeting. These, these things, life is fleeting. And 
success is fleeting and everything that we grasp for and we hope for uh, tends to evade us. It's elusive. And so I think, though, like he was saying, <clears throat> with Christ in our lives, with, with God as our anchor, with God as our compass, in this world as you know as creatures existing that god has made in this world we start to understand that he our place in eternity that's kind of what like the bible says god has set eternity in the hearts of men so that we understand that our treasures the meaning of our lives is laid up in the sky in heaven with god with jesus so that's the meaning that's the purpose because that's our home our home is not this world so um we have to try to keep our life our temporary temporal life in this world in perspective to in light of eternity the fact that that's the future for us our future our eternal future was with god and jesus in the eschaton you know that's where we're headed so our brief life in this world compared to the eons endless eons of, of, of eternity that are coming for us as christians we have to keep to realize that really our life in this world is just the womb of eternity. It's just a preparation for us to get ready to live with, with, with Christ, with Jesus and God forever in, in heaven and in, in the new heaven and the new earth. Um, and that's, that's what's coming for us. And so we have to, as children that are born into this world, little babies, we come into this world, we don't know anything about God's ways. So we have to learn in church and we have to learn as we grow in our relationship, you know, first in our salvation, and then we grow in our relationship with God as, you know, in church and all the ways that God is, you, you know, things he's using to grow us, his word and worship and fellowship and, and prayer and all these things, you know, communing. And, and so we're growing in our understanding of God and his ways, his, his government, the way God governs his universe, you know, the kingdom of God. So we have to learn all that because we're going to be living in that realm, you know, in the kingdom of God forever. So life is just preparation for eternity. That's the way I see it. And I think King Solomon kind of shows us that, uh, you know, as the king of Israel, you know, he had some serious advantages that other people don't have. Uh, he had a lot of gold, King Solomon did. So he was rich. He was, he was a wealthy, a wealthy king. Joshua, this is a big statement. How does it hit you? Well, um, on top of what the uh, the other guys have been saying, it I think it's very important to uh, to remember that Solomon was doing his best to increase his his standing to to use the wisdom that he had to get as much or to garner as much success as he possibly could. Um, and in this particular situation, reminds me of a, a quote by G.K. Chesterton. Uh, where uh, I believe he said something along the lines of meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. Um, and in this case, after, after he had done all that he had done and achieved all the success that he had, he really measured it. And it speaks, it speaks to a similar issue of uh, modern day with a lot of people that are you know, hyper successful. They have everything that they could possibly want. Um, you know, they've made all of the right moves, if you will, as far as gaining uh, either fame or wealth or power or whatever you want to call it. And a lot of them get to the same point where they realize that it's all ultimately meaningless because there is something about it which does not actually satisfy the emptiness that you have in your soul. And that really does, in, in my mind, like the other guys were saying, point to, to the need for God more than anything else. And that even though you may, you may go out, you may have success, you may do all the things that you can do, ultimately, when you really gain what you have or gain what you were searching for, you know, and that's, that's the, uh, not to get off on a different subject, but that's kind of another issue is that a lot of people have things in their mind that they think, oh, this is what I want. This, this will fulfill me. This will be amazing. And then the chase of getting it is, 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 you know, they, they fight really hard to get it and then they finally get it. And then they realize, oh, this isn't, this isn't exactly as fulfilling as I thought it would be. And I think ultimately that kind of train of thought was, on Solomon's mind when he was writing these words that he basically had the ultimate that you could have in that time period 
um, of power, of wealth, of influence. And he realized that, okay, even though he had all of that, it didn't really fulfill him at the end. That's a big conclusion to, to, to be smacked in the face with, to be honest with you. Um, Brother Ken, are you, there's a conclusion right here in verse 18. And I wonder, wondered if you would read verse 15 to 18 for us. Sure, sure. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. Verse 16, I said to him, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Kendo, that hits me right between the eyes. This idea, let me restate what the verse says. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. Now here it comes. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Ken, that's not exactly what we were hoping for when we were young and wanting to go out into this big, beautiful world and have experiences and find out what's true and what's wise and what's right and what's good. And now we're being presented with this very counterintuitive conclusion in verse 18. What do you think about that, brother? I'm just thankful to God that he replaced all that the disillusionment I had after it hit me. He replaced it with Christ. He replaced it with good things, biblical things, because without that, I probably, I don't know if I would have made it because the disillusionment comes, you know, uh, some things can't, the, these crooked things can't be made straight. You know, there's just some things in the world that are never going to be made right, you know, and here we are, we think we have guarantee of success. We, you know, we go to the right schools, we get the right job, we have the right degrees, the right everything, the right this, right that. And there's no guarantee that that, that is going to be enough without God in it. See, what I learned is that without God, it's like Psalm 127, right? <laughs> unless, you know, the Lord builds the tower, <laughs> unless he builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless he, well, he's doing the watching, the guard, the guard keeper is watching in vain. If God's not in your life, you're just, you're, it's like you're just spinning your wheels. You know, you're not, you, you have no ultimate success, no ultimate, you know, Jesus told us to lay up our treasures in heaven, you know, where the moth and they, the thieves don't break in and the moths don't corrupt it, you know, because where your treasure is, where your heart is. So, we have to come to the realization as Christians that this life is brief. We are not going to be here that long. We really need to get ready for eternity, for a life with God and Jesus in heaven forever. That's really what, what we need to be focusing on. You know, and that's it's easier said than done. You know, we have to make time for God. We have to try to meet with him once a day. We should try to, you know, and, uh, you know, sweet hour of prayer, you know, because it's good. it's better for us, you know, to realize that, the time's going to come. We're going to get sick and we're going to, something's going to happen to us and we're going to be on our way out of this world. And for people who aren't ready for that, ready to meet thy maker, it's going to be rough, you know? So I think that what we can do is we can look at Solomon's, you know, admonishments here and his observations, especially verse 18, to realize the more you realize about this world without God, it's not going to improve your attitude. It's going to make you more cynical, more skeptical. We see it all around us on social media. All these, these. The Bible says the sorrow of the world produces death. It doesn't, you know, without God, without our trust in the Lord to get us through everything we have to face in life, illness, death, all the shocks and vicissitudes of this world that we have to go through before we actually physically die. Without having the Lord as our anchor, I don't know how I could do it. I could not do it, you guys. I would fail. I would fall apart. There's just something about this world that is, like Solomon says, so futile and so meaningless and so grasping for the wind 
that without God was an anchor of my reality to keep me grounded and centered and focused on what life is about, you know, you could really get off track. It would not be hard to get off track. And I'm just really thankful that the Lord got me to the place where I realized these things, you know, that he's the focus. He is got to be the number one focus of our life. So that we have some insulation from these difficult realities that Solomon observed here in, in Ecclesiastes 1. And that's that's basically what it tells me is that the smarter, the more of this world, the more information, more knowledge you get, you would think it would make you wiser, but it actually makes you grieve more because you realize, I can't even, I don't know how atheists do it. I really don't. I don't know how unbelievers do it in this world. You don't have, when bad things happen to you, you don't have anyone to turn to. You don't pray. You don't turn to God for comfort, for help, for rescue. I've been doing that my whole life when bad things happen. I'm sure you guys have too. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, no. You know, kind of like Job, you know, when the bad things happen, you you hit the floor and you pray, God, help me, have mercy on me, help me, you know. And, and with the atheists just cut themselves off from that experience with God that he wants us to have as with him as our savior, that our deliverer from all the things that can befall us, befall us in this life. So I feel really really bad. I feel really sad for the people who try to live life in this world. We all tried. We tried to live life in this world without without the Lord Jesus, without God. And we we all we all failed miserably. You know, we realize you it's not a tenable position. You can't live. There's no other way to live. You're going to need God. I tell atheists that you're going to need him someday really bad. So you might as well start talking to him now. With that, I'll pass it back to you, JC. <laughs> Amen, my brother. Now, now, I'm not seeking to put earthly wisdom and human wisdom on the same scale as the divine wisdom of God in the Holy Scriptures. But there is a really interesting parallel that I found. If you, look at, if you look at modernity, if you look at the secularizing forces of the Enlightenment, you'll find that on the secular side, modern people threw out the canonicity of the Holy Scriptures. They threw out the authority of the Holy Scriptures in favor of the thing that they were going to replace it with. And at the end of their lives, many of them found things, well, from my perspective, not speaking for them, but from my perspective, several of them reinvented the wheel by going back and concluding the same kinds of things that they could have learned simply by reading Ecclesiastes. And I want to hear what you have to say in light of this, but first I want to just give an example. One of the chief villains of all of human history, in my view, Friedrich Nietzsche, said this, he who fights with monsters should take care lest he thereby become a monster. And if you gaze for long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. And this is the part where even as I villainify Nietzsche, my heart goes out to him. Because listen to his next sentence. The thought of unaliving to Nietzsche is what? A great source of comfort. Maybe this wisdom stuff obtained under the wrong pretenses and for the wrong purposes isn't such a good thing after all. 
Joshua, go ahead. <clears throat> well, excuse me. Frederick Nietzsche was honestly a lot of a lot of. Uh, I I wouldn't I I. I I wouldn't call him a villain, <laughs> but I can see where you where you come from that because a lot of his work has been used to fuel um, secular, nihilistic, existentialistic modes. Um, and in fact, it, it is it is kind of important to know that a lot of the misinterpretation of some of his works were actually done posthumously by his sister, who. Uh, popularize certain aspects of his work but if if I, i'm i'm glad that you do feel some sympathy for him because he wrote um not only of, of course about the the this quote about the abyss but the the general idea was that this phrase god is dead right and a lot of people of course attribute it to him and they there are many christians who think oh this guy was just some kind of um arrogant you know what right um, but in fact, when he wrote those words, he wasn't saying those words in some triumphant and indignant way. He was saying those words actually in a very similar way to uh, how Solomon was writing Ecclesiastes. He's, he basically, there, there's, I, I can't remember it word for word, but it's a great uh, thing to, to read. It's the parable of the madman that was written by him. And he, he goes on and on about like, what, what were we doing when, we unchained this earth from its sun. Are we not constantly falling backwards and sidewards and forwards and in all directions? He said, how will we wash ourselves of this blood and the guilt of, of, of this crime? <clears throat> and basically the, the, uh, the whole idea was, is that, that humans would then have to then make the decisions on what is right and what is wrong. And they'd have to be the standard for that. And he recognized that that was a huge problem. Um, in fact, he did, he predicted that the, uh, 20th century would be the bloodiest of all, all, and he wasn't wrong. He was quite right. He was exactly right. If, if, if anything, Nietzsche was honest about his nihilistic and atheistic conclusions, and I think that it's very important to to remember that when he wrote what he wrote, it was it was basically in this semi despair where he he tried to figure things out, but ultimately, in in terms of the 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 increasing knowledge and increasing of wisdom increases grief and sorrow that ultimately ties back to a, a very well known saying ignorance is bliss and the ultimate truth is is that when you when you are aware of the the corruption if you're you're aware of the sin nature of humans you're aware and you see what they do and it's not all sunshine and rainbows and you're more focused on on seeing all the bad things, it really does give this negative view, and it's it's because it's hard to ignore. I mean, if you if you're that intelligent that you can see the big picture of things and you can see people working and you understand how things uh, can be, you know, manipulated and and employed to bring about success, then you also see the negativity of many individuals in the world. Excuse me. So I think that a lot of it stems from that. And the idea is that is, is again is that the more the more that you know, the more you really get this picture and all the good things that the world has to offer, all these, you know, things that, that would give you pleasure, things that would be enjoyable, start to become less and less enjoyable. And you really do see how many, many great philosophers came to similar conclusions about how uh how you know the uh, i think it's it's an ethics where something to the effect of that a person should you know uh shouldn't really rejoice themselves in 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 the moment they should try to you know give away everything and help other people and all this other stuff to try to try to gain some sort of moral high ground and it just it's just interesting to see how all the logical outworkings have gone through this and i, I think that's really what uh solomon was really hitting on was that the more you see the more you recognize that there's a lot of issues in the world and by increasing your knowledge and increasing your wisdom you just you see them you try to fix them but you can't because there's something inherently uh broken with humans and 
I think that ultimately leads to uh, leads to Christ. I mean, it's 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 one other need that we really have. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to you. Amen. Benjamin, go ahead. I think I am probably in the middle ground here on Nietzsche. I'm probably in the sort of more of a moderate view where um, I think that Nietzsche was definitely the sum total of Nietzsche's work, I think, ultimately had a negative effect. However, I think that part of that negative effect was a misunderstanding of his work and a re-editing of his work by his sister. Uh, I wouldn't personally, I, I would personally consider him to be like uh, less malignant than Marx, but you know he definitely contributed to the, he definitely contributed to the train of thought. So, um, I do find more sympathy from Nietzsche than Marx, but uh, I think that his point here, uh, I think this this quote that we were we were going to definitely the uh the thought uh before you try to do it is is you know this will get me out of this this it'll all be over and i think that uh without an acute awareness of god's sovereignty and eternity that these are things that are very tempting and i think that without i i told somebody just last week i said that um I said that uh, if it wasn't for God, if it wasn't for the reality of God, if there was no God, then it would be most sensible to kill oneself as soon as possible because you would just essentially be escaping the life which would comprise mostly of suffering. And uh, I think that, unfortunately, I would say that's one of the things that I think that Nietzsche was kind of onto something with. I don't agree with his atheism, and I think that that was harmful. But I do think that his view that society had effectively killed God in their consciousness uh, was not too inaccurate, uh, because I think they really did do that. Um, you know, I don't think he was really celebrating it. Uh, I think he kind of embraced it at one point, but um, I think that without God, there is no meaning to life. And I don't think, I think the problem that Nietzsche had was that he tried to come up with a moral solution or a solution for morality or a reason to live uh, when really there is none without God. So I think he was trying to, I think he was, you know, overcome with unbelief and that he really had no way to fix it. So, and, and I might add, I do think that his philosophy had a harmful effect and I think that it was a big contribution to, uh, damaging society. But I also do think that part of that was people taking from his philosophy, what they wanted to take. And I think, um, I guess I kind of view Nietzsche a little like, Maybe not as favorably as De Descartes. I feel like that Descartes wasn't bad. He just people misinterpreted his his philosophy. I feel like Nietzsche was kind of not as noble as Descartes for sure. But again, what's that old song? It's the Boxer by I think Simon and Garfunkel. It says a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. So you know, at the end of the day, we are kind of responsible not only for what we say but what we you know, caused people to hear. Um, so not always altogether responsible, but great, yeah. great uh, reference there. Great minds think alike. Now, now, Kendo, I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction here. I grew up loving the television show and the movie <clears throat> Mash, and I remember the impact. The I'm trying to think of the right word. Not not canonical impact, but I remember this idea that MASH was the critical, the critical way to start thinking about warfare. And, and I don't mean, of course, 
uh, contemporary to when it happened, but here in the 1970s and 80s, when when it had come out, people were really reevaluating. And Brother Ken, ever I used to love that <coughs> humming those humming that song, the opening song to the TV show, and uh, it made me want to learn the lyrics. And as soon as I learned the lyrics, uh, I stopped <coughs> I stopped humming that song. And in fact, I question now whether it was even wise for me to watch that TV show. Now, not in a puritanical or, or a prudish way, but Brother Ken, let's go through the lyrics. Through early morning fog, I see visions of the things to be, the pains that are withheld for me. I realize and I can see. And then verse 2 recapitulates. The game of life is hard to play. I'm going to lose it anyway. The losing card I'll someday lay. So this is all I have to say. And then Brother Ken, without reading the chorus directly, Let's just say that it lines up with what Nietzsche said. And it really gives pause to this idea from verse 18 in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. But Brother Ken, there's, there's something more to this chapter, isn't there? Is there hope? Is there something over and above what this wisdom is granting the teacher there well there's a saying jc you guys have probably heard this there's a way there's the way it ought to be and there's the way it is <laughs> right so with life we take life as it is as it comes you know we are trapped here you know god has put us here um and they got guys like nietzsche and and uh you know uh the mash guy who wrote the mash tune uh very deep uh you know war teaches us the the hell of war teaches us the futility of existence what are we doing and and without god life really is futile it's a meaningless existence we're, we're striving it's just survival i mean it's just like what are if you don't have god in your life then what what are you doing that is greater than just mere survival you're you're licking the world you're tasting the world you're, you're you're enjoying the pleasures of a brief very brief life in light of eternity there really is nothing for us here as benjamin said without god god makes all the difference in the world like night and day because now we realize there is a creator and we are going to him so when we die our, our soul goes back to god who made it and that's you know, and then we await the first resurrection, and then our soul and body will be reunited, and we'll be with the Lord, like the Lord Jesus is right now. We'll be resurrected, we'll have a new body, and we will live with Him in bliss, you know, enjoying eternity with God in the presence of God. God will dwell with man. So we will be able to live with the one who bled for us, who saved us, who died for us, and we will be able to marvel and look at him, you know, this, this man who, who saved us from hell. And then we'll realize that sin really does have consequences in eternity. When we look at the lake of fire from our perch in eternity with the Lord, and we will know what we were saved from, that, you know, the cross in the middle should have been mine. You know, I don't deserve this, this goodness that God gave to me, this grace. I deserve hell. I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not going to get what I deserve. I'm getting grace. You know, I'm getting favor. I'm getting blessing, mercy. So, you know, God can forgive our sins because Jesus paid. He satisfied every legal requirement that God required for our sins against him. So, on that basis alone, realizing that, that Jesus is in charge. The Lord Jesus Christ is in charge of what happens to us. I would, I'm so thankful I'm in his hands. I'd rather be in his loving hands than anyone else's hands as far as like my eternal destiny goes, you know. 
So I know I'm not going to get a raw deal from God. I'm going to get grace. I'm going to get mercy. I'm going to, you know, and I, I just have to repent and keep repenting and turning from my sins. And, you know, I have to do it God's way. You know, that's what we learn as Christians. We have to learn that. And we have to try to help other people escape this, this God awful futility in this world that we've all been subjected to where we, it's just raw survival. It's just, survive for 70 80 90 years if you're lucky and then you die because god's going to pull your card at some point and you're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it it's determined it's fact you know so it's the way it is and we don't even have guarantees of our next day our next breath we don't even know when god's going to do that but we just know he's going to do it it's that knowledge of knowing that you're going to die knowing that everything in light of that fact you have to plan your life like for example uh, you might have family members who are getting older and they have wives and children and grandchildren. So what they have to realize is that they have an estate. They have to make a plan for their family. You know, they have to, they know they're going to die. They're getting up to be 70, 80 years old, you know? So they make a will and they put the people in their will and they, and they want to make provision for them when they're gone, you know? And I think that's kind of what it is, is it's like, we start to realize how brief our life is and that our life can be snuffed out in a heartbeat. You know, we wake up one morning, not people that died on the days they died. They didn't know that the day they woke up that morning, that was going to be the day they died. But I kind of try to wake up every morning saying, well, if this is my last day on earth, if this is it for me, live life in light of that. Just remember that, you know, fear God and depart from evil. Don't sin, you know, don't do anything that upsets the Lord, you know, just, you know, live right, do, you know, help people, make a difference in their life, love people, love God, worship God regularly, love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, you know, law of Christ kind of thing, you know, and that's basically how we have to live as Christians, you know, God is number one in our life, and that's it, you know, and everything else comes in view of that, and so I think that's how we can escape the futility that King Solomon's talking about here in Ecclesiastes, it's very real, you know, and the only way out is is God, is Jesus. He's the only way out for us to escape the reality of the striving and the grasping and the meaninglessness and the vanity that we are all subjected to in this world, in this life. But our life isn't meaningless when we have Jesus. That's what we have to remind ourselves. The meaninglessness becomes meaningful because having God means that everything we do in life is crucial. Now everything has meaning. Even the, even, the, even the wickedness and the bad things that happen to us, you know, even God can bring goodness out, his divine goodness out of those things. So suddenly with God in it, Psalm 127, when God's in it, we, we submit our plans to God. We, make, we, we live our lives with him in the loop. Lord, what do I do? Is this right? Should I make this decision? Is this what you want me to do? Please guide my steps. Help me here, Lord. I don't know what to do. When you put God into your life, it makes all the difference in the world. And suddenly all the futility, it's, it becomes almost bearable because you know that all this I'm doing ha will reverberate in eternity. It's not a waste of time. You know, it's not a waste of time to you know, do works in your church and help your, your family, your church family and help the, your friends and your family. God looks at all those things and all those things matter to God, you know, our, our, our service to him, our service to our fellow man. That's what it's all about. That's what Jesus taught us. He taught us to love God and love man, you know, make a difference, you know. So as long as we're doing that and, and that's the trajectory of our life, I think that, yes, the futility will still be there. It's not going to go away. We're, we're in it, you know. But it, it just means that suddenly the, the things we thought were futile, according to King Solomon's wisdom, we realize with God in it, with Jesus in it, suddenly all our works matter. Our works matter now because we've been saved by the grace of God. We know where we're going. We know we have a home with God in heaven because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And so now we live our lives in light of that. What we do in this world, yes, we will be audited. God will audit our lives when it's all said and done in the eschaton. And he will, you know, the credit we get for we, what we did after we were saved, as far as like our, our faithfulness and, you know, whatever whatever rewards that are available for good Christian faithfulness in, in, in the judgment in the eschaton. The Lord will do those things. That's his jurisdiction. But we just have to be faithful. We know we're saved. Protect your faith in Christ. It's very precious. 
So we have to protect it because as we see, people are falling away from Christ a lot now. It's happening more and more apostasy. People we thought were strong Christians are falling away and that could happen to us. The danger's there. So we have to protect our faith in Christ, our faith in God, protect it, hold on to it, and, and fight the good fight of faith in light of the reality of what Solomon's saying, that life is futile. Without God in it, I feel sorry with, for people who are rejecting Christ because their life is futile, you know? And it's God that makes all the difference and makes our lives have meaning and, and not futile because we lay up treasures in heaven. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, J.C. Burt. My friend, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, for our panel members and for our viewers, it's going to get better. Honest. But before it gets better, well, let's just read. The second quote, one highlighted here from Arthur Schopenhauer, says this. Now, this is a, this is, these are summary kinds of judgments about the world and the universe and life and meaning in consequence of taking the path of, of secularized modernity. Schopenhauer says this, if the immediate and direct purpose of our life is not suffering, then our existence is the most ill-adapted to its purpose in the world. And what he's saying really dovetails with this portion that we've read from Ecclesiastes. Suffering is the lot. This is the wisdom that can be discovered in the course of inquiry by the natural human reason. Right above it, Schopenhauer says this, the life of an individual is a constant struggle, not merely a metaphorical one against want or boredom, but also an actual struggle against other people. He discovers adversaries everywhere, lives in continual conflict, and dies with sword in hand. Now, Benjamin, I want to get to you. I, I, wanted, I want to... I want to just do one more Schopenhauer quote here. Today it is bad, and day by day it will get worse, until at last the worst of all arrives. This is an, this is an accurate view of the existential situation. And, and Benjamin, did anybody in the secular academy, when they sent about the task of philosophizing, did they necessarily know that they were coming to this end? And if so, were they prepared for the ramifications of it? What are your thoughts, my friend? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is just kind of able to be discerned with the rational mind. You know, it's like we talk about so many times is that the, you know, the things of the spirit of God are only revealed by the spirit of God through revelation. They're not revealed through just figuring them out. I mean, human reason is a tremendous tool uh, in the arsenal of the believer. However, without revelation, minus revelation, uh, it's not able to see the solution. It's not able to see the, it's, it's able to see the world without God, but it's not able to see God outside of the world. And 
you know, I think that human reason and human rationale is able to conclude that uh, this world in its in its particular essential nature is really just all about hardship. It's really very little about pleasure. And I think that's I think that's maybe the point you're making is that uh, you know the human mind can come to these conclusions because they're just immediately evident. Yes, I I think I think that uh, to what's been mentioned is that there there is a difference, of course, between God's ability when it comes to reason and say a human ability to come to reason or to use utilize reason and wisdom. And I don't, I don't see it as, as different categories. I see it more as like a difference of degree in that if God sees something as say the right decision <clears throat> or a human sees something as a right decision, the, the understanding that a human has is not going to be as, as great of depth as what God's is. However, the decision may still be in line with it. Um, I guess to kind of take a, an, a, an example is if, if I have a chessboard, right. And I make a move on the chessboard and it is the best move in that particular position. I may have made it because I figured, okay, this is, this is probably the best move. Now God would obviously know what is the best move. Um, and it, as such, it's 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 i don't see it as like a difference of category um but i do see that when it comes to wisdom humans have a limitation on every facet of themselves it's not that uh it's not that god doesn't see the stuff too and it's not that god doesn't it doesn't hurt god either it pains him i'm, I'm in fact it's 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 very much stated in the bible that it, that it does and that he loves us and that he wants what's best for us but the fallen nature of the world and the the broken nature of humans and our selfishness cause great grief. Um, it's that more the wiser you become, the more you really start to see all of that, and then it 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 gets very very depressing. And so what this particular uh, philosopher is trying to say is, hey, um, don't worry about all that. If you don't think about it too much, and you just you know, keep everything simple, then you won't, you won't worry about it. You won't know about it. And it's, it's very true in a lot of day-to-day -day lives with, with individuals. I, it's, it's funny because we keep talking about the meaninglessness of, of pleasure and the people who tend to be the, the most depressed, if you will, or, or, or have struggled with that seem to be the ones that don't have as much to struggle with you see people that are in 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 many parts of the world that struggle and life is extremely hard they they prioritize family they have all these values um that a lot of people in especially like our society where they have they have they don't have the same kinds of struggles where every day you know you have to you have to find make ends meet and so it seems to me that that those people not to say that they don't have problems, but they don't, they almost don't really have the time or the, the, the leisure, if you will, to really think about these things and to, to consider that because when you have to chop down, you know, however much trees to the, in the day and you've got to, you've got to get the water and you've got to do all these other things, you have, you have to devote all your time and energy to those things. And I think ultimately not, not that this guy is saying that we should, we should get back to, uh, you know, um, it was, was sort of looking for like kind of like a neo luddite of being against technology and all this stuff. I think it's more uh, along the lines of the the ignorance is bliss uh, mode of thinking, and it's just it's it's it. I th I think ultimately, if I'm not mistaken, in the book of Ecclesiastes, and you may get to it, I'm not, I'm not sure, but there's a point at which um, Solomon gets to a point and he says. You know, of all the things that I've done and after all the stuff that I did, I found that there are only a couple of things that you really got to worry about. And he says the one is that you have to follow God and keep his commandments. And the second is, is that whatever you find to do, whatever you have to do, you do the best you can with it and you just kind of keep going with that. And I think that ultimately, not that 
I haven't seen anything about uh, Schopenhauer, you know, appealing to God in that sense. But I mean, it does kind of get the same vibe as the second part, which is saying, hey, just do what you need to do. Focus on that and don't worry about the rest of it. That's kind of the the, the feel I get. Uh, I just actually had a question that I wanted to ask Joshua uh, because he was kind of hinting at this. And I don't know what if this is specifically what he was hinting at or not. Would you at least concede that we are not able to access divine reason? Obviously, God has a dis- divine reason that is his mind, but which is a higher form of wisdom than a human ability, a human mind is able to reach on its own. Would you, maybe a middle ground term there that would satisfy both of us would be, would you say that God has to share that level of wisdom with us rather than, um, in, in, in other words, that that's what I'm calling revelation is God sharing divine reason with us. Would you say that sounds right to you or how would you? I, would, I would, I would say that that's, I would say that's accurate that I could agree with that. The, the idea is that God has within his nature, the possession of omniscience. He contains all knowledge. Um, and also his, his faculties are not limited in the way that ours is. And so, the way I would really look at it is that anything that is not capable of being accessed by humans has to be re- re- uh, uh, revealed by God through his uh, means, either either in, in special revelation or even there's there's the, the thing is, I guess anything that could be revealed in general revelation would be by definition, something that could be divined through human reason. So, for example, as you're well aware you could you you know there's the uh how it's often said that you can look at the nature uh the heavens uh was it the heavens declare the gl- the glory of god in the firmament sure it's his handiwork so in that re- uh, in that respect yes and there are many things that we know actually that that humans just can't know that we'll never know for certain that that god knows and that kind of gets more deep into philosophical uh precepts such as things as um uh, Girdles and completeness theorem, which is a fun one, but that's kind of I'm just throwing that out there is to say that there are things that that we know we could will never be able to really know. There are things that are true that with the with the tools that we have, we won't be able to to prove those to be true. Um, and that that's not just about God. That's actually about reality and things in mathematics and things in logic and and you know the the list goes on. But I think that yes, you would be very correct in saying that anything that god has access to that we just don't in order for us to know them god has to reveal them to us in some way okay yeah i was just wondering what you thought on that because you know i didn't want it to come across like i was saying that revelation is just a revelation of some mystical concepts Uh, i believe that they are things that are contained within the rational mind of god you know that God, yeah, God is the ultimate. That. God is the ultimate rational being. I mean, He possesses level of rationality far beyond ours. Okay, sorry, JC. Sure. I just he referenced me, so I was gonna respond. Okay, well, no problem there, my friend. That actually circles back nicely. And uh, and brother Ken, I just wonder as we get back to the beginning of the chapter. We are building up to the opening. (laughs) And I wonder, Brother Ken, if you would just read from verse 2 down through verse 8 for us, please. Sure. Sure, JC. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Ken, how does that hit you, especially especially that verse? Would you read verse 8 again and then give us your thoughts on that section? Sure. Everything is wearisome beyond description. 
No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. And I, the way it hits me is that I think there comes a point in our lives as men on the earth. I think as we get older and we see the sorrow, like that verse, the sorrow of the world produces death. The more sorrow, the more death we experience, the more people we lose, the more pain, the more loss, the more, the more, right? Just more of all of this, this glaring reality that we're being exposed to all the time. And it's blinding and painful and difficult, you know, and um, there's a certain amount of insecurity in the world, in a world like this, where everything is futile, everything is just racing, 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 you know, rats on a treadmill, hurry, 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 get it done, hurry up, you know, hurry up, you know, that it's like you ever, you ever drop when you're driving, right? And then you have this guy bat out of hell, you know, you're driving the speed limit, and there's a red light up about a half mile ahead of you, right? You could see it. You got this guy who's just speeding right by you, passes you, almost cuts you off. And he's hurrying up to stop at the red light. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, you ever seen that before? You ever had that? Hurry up to stop. You know, you're going to have to stop anyway. It's a red light. You know, but this person just has to get there first. But every time I see that, that happens to me when I'm in the car. I always realize it's kind of like a like a parallel of life. It's like, there's all this to do and, and hurry, hurry, hurry. And, and, and let's get it done, you know? And, and then it's just, you're just waiting around, you know, it's almost, it, it, you ever had that absurdity just hit you in the face. It's almost like we're all just waiting around to die in a way because death is like the great equalizer, right? So it's, it's kind of like, Whatever I'm going to accomplish, there's this, this terminal point, this wall that's in front of me called death, my own death. And no matter what I accomplish or whatever, whatever success I achieve, that wall is going to come down and I'm going to hit that wall eventually. And there's no going past that. That's it. That's, it's a wrap for me. So when I live my life in light of that wall, that, that, that term, terminality of death that's coming, it, it kind of puts everything in a, in a weird kind of perspective, like, you know, like the, the, you know, like it's kind of like you ever seen that movie Blade Runner with uh, Harrison Ford and, uh, and uh, 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 Rutger Hauer plays uh, the, the replicant At the very end of the movie. Uh, he's, he's dying. Right. And he, he says this little soliloquy, he says, as he's dying, he says, all those moments in time will be lost like tears in rain. I always thought that was really beautiful when he said that, like he's dying and he knows that all the things that he experienced in his life will, all the things that were significant to him, that, that were powerful and had meaning for him in his life will all just vanish like tears and rain how rain just blots it all out just gone you know and that's what death is it's like the termination point of everything that we've had in life but the good news and that's depressing you know that's very depressing death is a very depressing topic but the good news is that jesus is alive that he rose he conquered death and he's in charge now and he loves us you know and so that's the thing that keeps me going when I'm confronted with these realities that Solomon is talking about here in chapter one. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. It's just like that life has this way of like, I just want more. I have to keep consuming more and more and more. You know, it's just like uh, this endless treadmill of consumption and taking in more and doing more and, and trying to accomplish more and this and that. And it gets tiring after a while. And as you come to the end of your life, you know, as we get older and older and approach death, we, we get ill and we realize what was it all for? What did I, what did I achieve? I, the only thing I achieved is to be able to pass it on to someone else, my children or my family, you know, and that's the sum total of it. You know, all this working and hard work and everything, but 
it's not a waste because with God involved in light of eternity as believers, everything we do now has meaning. That's the that's what we should realize in light of what Solomon is suggesting here in Ecclesiastes that for the Christian, everything we do has meaning now in the kingdom of God. God has taken the poison and turned it into medicine. The poison of futility and life of life in this world that Solomon is showing us because he's right. God takes all that futility and gives it meaning and purpose and gives us hope that we can actually lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven where where rust doesn't corrupt and, and you know we where, where we'll we'll have hope for ourselves in this world of meaninglessness and death and hopelessness that's we're confronted with every day as we lose more members of our family and our friends you know to death and illness you know we 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 know it's coming for us too but because we have Jesus in our life and he gives us his hope his his victory over all things we have this now and that's an anchor of our soul so we don't get we don't get uh, diminished or overwhelmed by the reality of the truth of verse 8, that all of it can be looked at as a waste of time, uh, 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 like we're on a treadmill, you know, just buzz, you know, spinning out your, your wheels on your bike and you're going nowhere. You're just going nowhere. You're getting nowhere. The, the, you know where you get? You get a grave, a six feet under. That's where you're headed. And that's hard to deal with as human beings, knowing that no matter what I strive for, what I accomplish, no matter the highest heights I could I could achieve as a human being, it's all ends in death. It it's it it just does something to you psychologically, you know, spiritually, realizing that, you know, um, and so that's why keeping the hope of Christ at the center of our being is very important. Protecting your faith in Christ, protecting that relationship that you have with Him. And realizing that he has given us an, inher an inheritance so that when we do die, it's not over. It's just the beginning. This world, this life is just the womb of eternity. You know, I think that this whole, I think that this whole passage is really just describing the cyclical, how everything is just recycled over and over again. There's really nothing that you can do that's really making a difference. You're just kind of experiencing the same thing that everybody else experienced. And I think that this was for him, uh, somebody who really wanted to apply his wisdom and apply the things that he had learned and all this study that he'd done. I think this was kind of a shocking realization was that uh, really there was nothing new to be done. And it was all just kind of uh, just part of one big cycle. And I think that was pretty depressing, you know? So, uh, I think it's very wearisome when you realize that you're just doing the same things over and over and over and over. Everybody likes variety. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you realize they're kind of in some ultimate sense, isn't really much variety to what's going on. It, it just all becomes mundane. Well, I think a lot of the points have pretty much already been said, but I just want to pay special, uh, special attention to this, this idea of the, like, he uses in verse seven, the rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. And then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. I think it's more like this idea. There's several concepts uh, that the, the, the ancient Greeks had uh, one, one uh, was this idea of Sisyphus. And of course, Sisyphus was the mythological figure who had the boulder that he was constantly rolling up to the top of the hill, but he was cursed by the gods so that the boulder would roll back down and he would always have to repeat the same process. It's this idea of like trying to build castles in the sand. It's not so much just that it's the repeatability of it. It's that the repeatability of it gets you nowhere. You, you ultimately build this empire or build this kingdom as as uh i'm sure solomon did but you ultimately realize that in time that kingdom will fall there's nothing there's nothing that endures about it uh that really has uh merit unto itself for, in a lasting way uh there's a, a a really good poem uh called ozymandias which speaks to the same kind of thing if i recall correctly and i'll probably butcher it 
Um, but it ends up saying something to the effect of, you know, uh, there's a statue or part of a statue in the, the wastes of a desert. And on the statue, it says, I am Ozymandias. Everyone will, you know, fear me. I'm the, the, the biggest of the big and the baddest of the bad. I, I, like I said, I can't remember the exact quote. But the, effect, the, the ultimate point is, is that even with all of the might that he had, even with all the stuff that he had, it was a ruin. It was everything that he built up was gone. It passed away. And so I think ultimately that when Solomon is saying this, everything is meaningless mode, it really speaks to the, the res he asked the question, what's the result of it? Like ultimately what we're doing, what's, what's the point of it? And that really gets him to this nihilistic point, which actually speaks back as we mentioned earlier to even like Nietzsche and, and modern philosophers, which ultimately I think it becomes self-evident that when you examine all the things that you do and you think about it, okay, the world's going to keep on turning. Um, you can actually go even further and you can say, you know what, eventually, you know, the, the, the universe is supposed to uh, end uh, in some sort of heat death. You know, the, the sun's going to eventually explode, take the earth with it, but eventually like everything in the universe is supposed to stop and no more energy for anything to happen. And it's all, it's all done. And that's ultimately the same kind of uh, train of thought is that if if it doesn't last, if it doesn't really stick around, then ultimately there's there's it's it's like why do it? It almost feels pointless, or it does feel pointless as as clearly you know uh, he wrote. So yeah, that's that's my two cents on that. I was in a Bible study where we talked about this chapter, and this was 30, 35 years ago. It's a long time ago. And there was a young lady in the Bible study who was very upset that we read this chapter. Why? Why read this chapter, she accused. It's too depressing. It's too overwhelming. All it's going to do is lead people. To, to harm. And she was very put out. A and I think I've found other people like that through the decades who have felt a similar way. And that makes us, as students of the Bible, we have a question to answer. What do we do about passages in the Bible that make us feel bad? I don't use the air quotes mockingly, but, but there's this situation that comes up where we have a chapter, and the Bible is confronting us with something that, well, it, it's going to change everything. And yet we as believers wish to say, to people like that young woman, read this text. And there's a reason why you should read this text. And that is this. The Bible is a gift. The Bible is described as a book of comfort. Now, how can the Bible be a book of of comfort when it is so discouraging in places like this. And over the years, a certain hymn comes into my mind. And I use that hymn to, to talk to people. And that's this. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. But the light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at the noon day, his glory shines in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. It's mm -hmm. shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned 
upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. I hope that that young woman, she's of course middle-aged now, as am I, I hope she found that the Bible really is a book of comfort for those who read it and find eternal life in its pages. Brother, I, I think, you know, my dad was a preacher. He passed away a couple of months ago. And, um, you know, there was one, um, there was a very, very attractive young lady that had a lot to live for in this world's type of philosophy. And, you know, she would visit my father's Facebook page. Lovely person. But she would always be bothered by the fact that he would post what 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 would be she would call sobering things. And she would always say, why does it have to be so sobering? Why does everything always have to be so sober? And I think it's conviction. I think it's conviction in the person's heart is that they they realize they're kind of drunken with the world and they 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 kind of they realize it, it shakes them, you know, that soberness, that serious shakes them because it, it makes them aware of that existential agony as, you know, as we called it and uh, makes them aware of it. They don't want to, you know, especially if they've got something that they feel like they can live for in this world. And they're kind of, you know, enchanted with the world, intoxicated with the world. They don't want to, they don't want to be, they don't want to wake up and, um, you know, I'm not making any judgments on her. Uh, you know, she the, the verdict's still open on her. She could still come around to the Lord and everything. But I think a lot of people don't want, you know, it says that the light, that men didn't come to the light because they wanted their evil deeds to not be revealed. They wanted to hold on to that evil. And But other people would come to the light so that their works could be made manifest in God. And I think that, at the end of the day, I think that we need both things. Uh, we need that sobering, staggering reality that this life is not what it's all about and that eternity is long. Um, and we also need the hope of the gospel. You know, we need the light of Jesus because I think if we don't have Jesus, what, what is really the hope for this? I think that's why I was telling a friend of mine today was that, um, you know, the philosophical movements of the last several hundred years have all been attempts by man's rational mind to solve the dilemmas of the previous generation before them. And so they try to come up with new solutions. And now it's ended up in postmodernism, metamodernism, and all these things like that, where they're just kind of giving up, I guess is the way you would put it. They're kind of just giving up and saying, do whatever you want. It's none of this is going to matter. And I think that's really the ultimate destination of, um, you know, thinking these things out without hope, you know, got to have the hope uh, because it's like uh, Paul wrote in, I think, Romans, where he said that before we, we had the good news of Christ, we were without hope in the world. And I think that uh, the light of the world is Jesus, that this is what brings hope and um, you know, thank God for Jesus. So, <clears throat> well, I, I I pretty much agree with with like I said all of that. There's just uh, something I'd like to add, which is, um, in all these things that people uh, that the philosophers and so on and so forth, <clears throat> as they became, they strayed more away from this idea of God. Um, there's uh, G.K. Chesterton is 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 an absolute wellspring of great quotes but i think uh there's one that uh came to mind here too which is uh when men choose not to believe in god they do not thereafter believe in nothing they then become capable of believing in anything and it really speaks to this situation in in my view that a lot of this existential crisis that people go through which of course existentialism is this this the attempt to deal with the human experience and existence um in some form or fashion and when they 
they don't apply to the 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 Christian mode or the theological direction, they then end up getting to this point where they effectively try to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And the problem is, is that when people get to this point, they look at the reality of it and they don't want to accept the fact that, you know, this nihilistic view is probably accurate. Like I said, uh, I think Benjamin said earlier that if God doesn't exist, um, the nihilism is pretty much it. Uh, it's, it's, it's everything's meaningless at that point. But a lot of people don't like that. And as such, they really bend over backwards and do all sorts of mental gymnastics to try to do this, this philosophical pulling them uh, a philosophical act of pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. And that's why they really appeal to these things such as, well, you know, my truth is, is this what's true for me may not necessarily be true for you, which of course, you know, vaporizes so vaporizes in its own puff of logic really when you try to analyze that but it, it becomes more about how you feel rather than what things actually are and that that is relevant because the same the same feeling of meaninglessness and hopelessness comes from recognizing the truths of the world brother ken you've said it several times in this discussion You've echoed the lyrics that are on the screen here. You dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes. The light of the world is Jesus. Go, wash at his bidding, and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Then it says in that fourth verse, No need of the sunlight. In heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Brother Ken, what's that? What are these lyrics trying to tell us? Is there, can we read the scriptures, even Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and still? have hope. Yes, because you're right, JC. Jesus is that great light that, that lights every man coming into the world. Every child, that's why we have to teach. You don't have to teach children how to sin. It comes natural, right? But you have to teach them about the Lord, and you have to teach them about God and what God expects from us. And so it's very important that every child coming into the world is lighted by Jesus Christ. Christ, the great light that lights every man that's that lit us so we know that he is that great light and so um we know that you know he wants us to come to him and we we, we form our relationship with him as we understand that he's been looking out for us he's the one that's been looking out for us since we were in our mother's womb so at some point you make that connection oh it was you lord you were the one that helped me through that you were the one that got me through that when I didn't know what to do that time and I was afraid and you were there, he's the one that's always been helping us when we had nobody to rescue us. It was the Lord Jesus. He was watching out for us from heaven. So, you know, it was him. And and then it, when I when that finally hit me, when it finally dawned on me that all those rescues, when the Lord rescued me, it was him, you know? And it was like, when I was just forlorn, I didn't know what to do. I was desperate, you know? And it was Jesus that rescued me. And he just wanted me to know that. He wanted me to realize it was me, Ken. I got you. You know, do you understand? So just trust me. Put all your hope, put all your trust, and all your dependence on me to for the rest of your life, for eternity. That's what this is about. It's about God getting us, his fallen creatures, to understand that he loves us. He provided uh atonement for our sins that you know our, our sin problem we all have so he did he provide he dealt with our problem there and he just wants us to accept jesus the the the, the our life who is our life now in this world so when he when you know jesus is our life appears you know we'll we'll understand all that we'll understand a lot more when we see him and, and when he comes for us you know and we'll we trust him you know so uh 
either way psalm 23 even if we die and we walk through that valley it's going to be his hand i assume at some point that's what we're all hoping as soon as we close our eyes open our eyes on the other other the other side we are expecting to see his face that's the only face i want to see is my my savior's face the one who bled to save me you know he's the one i'm hoping to see on the other side you know immediately so um because we don't know how we're going to exit this world we don't know how how it's going to be we don't we don't know you know so we just have to be ready and and tell everybody you know tell everybody what we know because we got a, we got good news for the world you know we, we tell look man it's not over it looks bleak i mean solomon paints the the picture for us you know it, it looks bleak um life is very bleak if you don't have god if you don't have the lord jesus christ as your hope as your anchor for your soul when hard times come you know death family members die you get illness you know financial burdens uh everything that can hit us in this world you know just calamity catastrophes that we've all been through you know and to realize now as christians we have hope no matter what happens we can have joy through those things you know we can we have hope we know as soon as we die we know what's we, we already know the whole story so we know what what's coming for us you know we're going to die and then our spirit is going to go you know our body goes in the ground wherever and then our spirit goes to be back with the lord and we'll be with the lord jesus forever for eternity so we'll just he'll be our master he'll just we just do we just follow him and we don't have to worry anymore like there's always worries down here right there's always problems there's always but once we get there there's not gonna be no more tears there's not gonna be no more sin no temptations of sin all that stuff's gonna be over with all we're gonna have is to be able to worship the Lord and gaze and look at our Savior and our Creator forever and and that's all we're gonna need that's all we're gonna want I just want to be able to look at him and know that he loves me and that he died for me and that's the reason why I'm there I'm I'm only there because of what Jesus did for me I should go to hell when I die because I'm guilty I've sinned against God but it's not going to happen because Jesus saved me. He died for my sins and I know it. So it's not a double jeopardy. He, he paid once for all. So my entire body of sin was nailed to the cross with Jesus and, and it's been judged already. My sins are already judged, all of them. There's no more judgment left for me. I'm off the hook. Jesus paid it all. There's none left, it's all, all of it. So I just trust him and I... God pardoned me of all my sins in Christ. I'm safe and, and sound in Christ. And that's our trust, you know, uh, having him as our righteous standing. Jesus actually gives us his own righteous standing that he has in heaven before God. Isn't that wonderful? We have a righteous standing before God the Father. Jesus is our righteous standing. His righteousness, he gives it to us so that we're, we're safe in him and we can, you know, we can, we were accepted by the father in christ you know and that's what we were our hope is as christians and i just feel so bad for people who don't have that hope that's what we're striving to give them that hope we talk to atheists we talk to i talk to the ones who i know are outside the camp you know you know that's just what god has me do you know he just i just do that because i know they need christ just like i need christ and i just tell them when you need to start forming a relationship with him you need to start talking to him you know, Jesus is not somebody that you can ignore indefinitely without consequences. You know, you're going to need him. And, 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 and people just, because God is so good and helping them so much in life, right? They think they don't need God. But what about, he, and the Lord knows, I just do one thing to your life, one tiny thing, and you're going to fall apart. And you're going to need me. You know, but God is so good, he doesn't do that. But he could do that to every single one of us. To where we're like, oh, what am I going to do now? You know, and then maybe, hopefully, they'll they'll grope for the Lord and reach out to Him. Lord, help me! I'm I'm I, I don't know what to do. I'm dying here. Uh, it's it's all collapsing on me now. I I need you. You know, and hopefully that's what the vicissitudes of life do to people, sinful people that realize they come to the end of themselves and they they start groping for God in the darkness in their in their in their in their pain and their suffering they start saying lord where are you i need you and that's hopefully what happens that's my prayer for everybody that doesn't know christ that they'll realize that he's right there he's just a reach away he's waiting for us to come to him and talk to him and and and, and give him a hug and say lord i need you so bad i need you so bad in my life you know and 
it's all because of Jesus that we have hope now. So it's awesome, you know, right? So he's always going to be alive. He's beyond death now. Death can't hurt him no more. So he's beyond death now. So he's in charge. Death bows to him now. He's in charge of death. He's the resurrection. Because everybody's going to get resurrected. Some do eternal life and some do eternal condemnation. So, But everybody gets resurrected. So we don't have to fear death like, you know, well, people who don't know Jesus should fear death. You know, that'd be scary to be facing eternity without him. I would be scared. But I know I'm, I'm going to die and he's going to audit me. You know, we're going to have our judgment, you know, for Christians. You know, uh, it's not our sins have already been judged at the cross. They're all paid for. So it's not a judgment for sin. It's it's like an audit for our faithfulness to him. You know, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat for rewards. Because some people were some Christians are did really good, you know, and they they did a lot you know and they with with a little you know and so they're going to get you know some recognition for that at the bema seat you know some really you know like the apostle paul you know people like that you know good christians throughout church history you know did a lot you know so we'll get to see that you know we'll get to be a part of that and and see and see how the how god honors their faithfulness you know it'd be wonderful to see that but yeah it, it without christ basically the story for me as christians for all of us guys is that without jesus our lives are hopeless and meaningless just like King Solomon says, but with God in it, we have every hope in the world. We have a future. He gave us a flag to fly. He gave us a hope and an eternity. And we have a lot. We have an inheritance in Christ now. And we should be jumping up and down because we know the truth. Jesus is the truth. And he told us, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? That's what frees us to know he's in charge. It, we're in his hands now. So whatever's going to happen to us is up to him. And he loves us. So what are we worried about? He's the one that died for our sin. Remember it says in the end of Romans 8, he says, he's, Paul's telling him, I, I just want you to know there's nothing that can separate you from his love. Nothing in this world will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He loves us and that's it. That's never going to change. And if you put your trust in him and you're depending on him to save you, he said, you trust me, you'll never die. It's what he told Martha when he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? He was assuring her, look, if you trust me, it doesn't matter if you die physically. I can just raise you up. I think that's what Abraham felt with Isaac. He knew that, well, uh, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. The Lord, I think Abraham figured the Lord could just raise Isaac back to life. So what am I worried about? He just had trust in God. He just knew that God was in charge. And, and that's what we have to just rest in the Lord, that he's in charge. There's nothing we can do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go his way, right? Not our way. He's the one who's in charge. He's the boss. So we just trust the leader. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, JC. Benjamin, Joshua, this has been an amazing chapter. Um, and to my way of thinking, um, though it talks about intense themes, though it brings up some of the most difficult and depressing aspects of reality, the very same point in time, this chapter, along with the rest of the Bible, really still does stand as a book of comfort, a book to be commended to people, a book to be read, to be cherished as a gift. What are your final thoughts? And um, Benjamin, we'll start with you, my friend. Well, you know, it's just a real privilege that the Lord decided to inspire these writings for us to have, because, you know, I often tell people, um, which, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are what I would consider anti-intellectuals, and while I know that intellectualism in itself is not the key to finding God, I think that being intelligent and using your intelligence is a, is a great tool. And, you know, some people believe that the Bible is the only form of knowledge. In other words, you know, they say, if it's not in the Bible, I don't care about it. Um, you know, they're not interested in anything that's outside of the Bible. And I think that's a misunderstanding of the Bible. I think that, uh, I think the Bible's better than that. And when I say better than that, is that I, you know, in order to read the Bible, we we have to have a natural ability to read the language that it's written in, and 
in order for it to be written in our language, there had to be an interpreter that was skilled in both the natural language of the original text and the natural language that he wanted to interpret it into. And that's a natural skill too. And, you know, the scripture in, I think, 1 Corinthians 15, it might be 45, but I know it's in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, says that that which is natural comes first and then the spiritual. And I think that a lot of the, you know, we have natural history, we have natural philosophy, we have natural uh, science, you know, we have all these things. But the Bible is the ultimate form of knowledge. That's my belief on the Bible, is the Bible is the ultimate form of knowledge. And the reason that it's the ultimate form of knowledge is because it contains the authority of God and the authority of God that's divested into certain specific authors and writers to teach us these ultimate forms of knowledge that come from God. And so I think that when you make the um, the Bible the only form of knowledge and you ignore all other forms of knowledge you're kind of kind of discarding the gifts that god has given to the natural man to the natural mind you're kind of discarding some of god's gifts there um and i think that when you contrast the the scriptures to natural knowledge and see that it's a higher spiritual knowledge an ultimate knowledge that's when you can really see that it's really something because the natural man by himself is able to see the hopelessness of life and the futility and the nihilistic nature of life without the hope of the gospel. But, but the scriptures give us not only a balanced wisdom of the hopelessness of living for this life, but also gives us the hope of the light of the gospel in addition and gives us that spiritual wisdom that uh, you know as first corinthians 2 i think it is says uh the the natural man can't comprehend it and so i'm just very thankful that we've got this that god decided to to give us uh, these texts that have been assembled into this book and that it's available to us in our language i just praise god that we've got this available i love ken's thumbs up amen amen Joshua, what are your final thoughts? Well, um, I definitely echo the sentiment of the thankfulness of the, the the Bible as really a gift to us to help us increase our understanding of spiritual things and how to live life. I do think um, that all forms of knowledge in their own way now, some more than others, but in their own way, they, they, I think they point to God. Um, uh, it was said that, you know, that the natural ends up recognizing the meaninglessness of the universe unto itself. And I think that ultimately, if a person reflected on that, they, they might conclude that there has to be a need for something greater, something beyond it in order to rectify that that meaninglessness and that a lot of individuals unfortunately just assume out of hand that there isn't anything beyond it and that's ultimately where they make the mistake they don't really uh play with that idea as much as they should i think the bible is a very very effective tool for what it is i don't think um, not not to try to to uh, put words into Benjamin's mouth because this wasn't what, this is not what he was saying. I don't believe that the Bible is the the sole source of of knowledge and end all be all way because obviously we have uh, as he mentioned historical knowledge, we have scientific knowledge, we have uh, philosophical knowledge, but the Bible is really at the heart of things it does get to the point in the sense that it establishes many times that if you do not have if you are not right with god then you are in danger of all sorts of perils and i think that the book of ecclesiastes is just one more facet of this it really shows and speaks to the individual who values wisdom 
and who places a lot of stock in that because a wise person is not a person that you should just be ignoring and a wise person is not a person that should should uh go against their wise decisions let's say and you should you should embrace those things but ecclesiastes says well those are good things and and you should do your best and you should you should try to go for success but ultimately that's not that is not the end goal and the end goal is ultimately through Christ and having a relationship with God and that's ultimately where you will find meaning because God is the one who gives everything meaning and he is that something that's beyond everything else in which all of it is rooted and i think that's that's a very uh heartening thought and that's that's basically the end of my final thoughts for that thank you my brother thank you <laughs> ken would you would you close our discussion with a prayer certainly guys certainly let's pray <clears throat> dear heavenly father Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this panel, Lord, and this show that we can do this, Lord, and, and, and talk about you, talk about your word, discuss these things with each other in fellowship with our brethren and sisters here. Uh, thank you so much, God, um, for just all the wonderful things you give us, Lord, and these wonderful ways you, you help us to acknowledge you and learn more about you and discuss these things with each other. And through the, through the things that we're going through in life, Lord. And it's just nice to know that you're there and that you're concerned about us, God, and that you're keeping us alive, Lord. And everything that we have is from you and for you and through you. And so we're just thankful, God. And just thank you for each member of this panel today. Thank you for J.C. Bear's willingness to host the host this show for us, Lord, so we can have this time together of fellowship and, and, and discussion about your word, Lord. We thank you for this, God. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this and thank you. Amen. Amen.